But I'm supposed to be key. looking at that. I'm not good at that. <laughs> now I'm staring right at it. All right, Robin, take us away. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Slam School, um, episode number 10, I believe. Um, with us today, we have um, two high school uh, social studies teachers from a local school. Um, but before we get started, um, I want to take a minute to remind you, my name is Robin Seglin. I am the president of SLAM. With us, we also have Nicole Mira, the vice president, and Ontario Garcia, the past president and the mastermind of SLAM School. Um, so if you didn't have a chance to join us last time, uh, we started out with Stefan and Pat talking a little bit about what they're doing with their social studies club and how they're helping their um, students become activists within the school. And we had ended at the, uh, with a technical difficulty, so we invited them back. And today they're going to speak to us a little bit more about what do we do if we're interested in having our students become more activists and we don't know how to get started. So, uh, gentlemen? Would you mind giving us a few ideas on how we could get started as teachers? Um, I think I'm going to put Pat on the spot because yeah. uh, I I became a teacher later in life than Pat did. I didn't start teaching until I was 30. Um, I was already identifying activists involved in anti-war work and um, among other things, uh, starting a, 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 a you know anarchist free school in our community, I was already heavily involved in activism before I started teaching, and teaching was sort of like the next logical step for me to turn activism into like a career of of uh, of trying to raise consciousness. Um, into it with the dedication to already just devote myself to it, and if there were negative consequences, I was ready to. Um, suffer those consequences but i think pat got into yeah, it the i was reverse. I, I got into it the reverse way i hadn't really been engaged with a lot of student activism uh until this year um with social studies club we had uh um at isu jesse hagopian came in and, and spoke to people at isu and so we brought some tell students him, tell there. Him he's from um jesse hagopian's from seattle right yeah. um so uh I te a public school teacher and he's been very involved with student activism and, and um and black lives matter movement out there getting kids involved and so I remember after that talk, we were, the kids wanted to get ice cream afterwards. We we're walking over to, to the ice cream place thinking like, man, I wish I could get kids at normal community high school doing stuff like that. And I was like, I have no damn idea how to do that. Like I have absolutely none. Um, and so what I do is just keep building up a positive community. Even though I didn't know what activism the kids wanted to get involved with, I tried to set up um, meetings with like the mayors, with local politicians. We had a uh, secretary of transportation under Obama, Ray LaHood, that lived in Peoria, so I was able to get him to come in. Um, there's, and I think the election happened, and that's what really catalyzed people. And I think already having that sense of community and having already connected them with some politicians, it just made it very natural for them to want to do things. And I didn't tell them we have to do this or we have to do that, but I tried to kind of give them suggestions as we went, saying like, we don't have to do any of this, but you know, like in January when the travel ban was in place and I could see that they were all very upset, what do you all wanna do? Do you wanna write a letter to a congressman? Do you wanna visit your congressman? Do you wanna try to hold a route? Like, giving them ideas because usually like 16, 17, 18 year old kids, they want to do something, but they don't exactly know what the options are. And so you got to kind of lay the options out, I found, and like they'll gravitate towards one of those and then you just kind of help them facilitate that. Because if they're down with it and they want to do it, they'll do, just kind of have to point them in the right direction. And like I said, at the start of the year, I never envisioned doing any of that stuff. Um, and so I think just creating that community and making sure kids open to that as well. I think a lot of times students just assume, oh, he's a teacher, she's a teacher, like they don't want to get involved with anything. So going out of your way to make students know you care about doing things and you'd be willing to work with them um, with activism, I think is important and you need to make that like explicit. At least that was my experience this year. Um, uh, we, yeah, and we've been cultivating, um, I guess, I, I have explicitly, but I think our whole department has intentionally, but um, 
unintentionally cultivating student leaders, student activists who then um, have sort of taken the initiative to step to the forefront of the clubs, like the social studies club that Pat sponsors. Like for the past two and a half years, or so, I can't remember how many years, I sponsored a club called the Peace and Justice Club. And, and um, we this year decided that uh, that club should merge with the social studies club. And some of those students became kind of the activist yeah. leaders of the social studies club. A couple of years ago, um, some of our students, um, some of my sociology students, tried to start with other students from a couple other schools, a local student union. Um, and I would coach them a little bit on that. And then that sort of culminated at the peak of that was a student walkout that they organized um, to, to, to protest park tests. And um, pretty cool. So I was working with some of those students behind the scenes and um, just giving them tips and advice and um, loaning them megaphones and you know, things like that um, to try to get them that said, I am very open about my involvement in community work. Um, I don't hold back. I talk mess about politicians in class very openly. Um, I, you know, it's just, I feel like we have an obligation, especially social studies teachers. We have an obligation to, to do the things that, that we are teaching about. If I'm trying to teach my students about the people that stood up um, in the civil rights movement in the 60s, the, or, you know, or like the white folks that got involved in the freedom rides. And I'm a white folk today that's not involved with Black Lives Matter. You know, that's hypocritical, I think. So I, we wear our Black Lives Matter shirts to school. Our whole department wears them, um, you know, and we're involved in the local movement. You know, some of us more than others, but we're all involved um, in some way. So, you know, you have to be open about it and you have to demonstrate it. You have to live it and um, and then just support the students that want to get involved. And like Pat said, share ideas and not be pushy. That's the thing, too. You can't be pushy about it. You just need to be there to support them and, and give them tips when they need it. And I think building up those positive relationships with kids too, and really trying to make sure you're reaching out to as many students as possible. Because I think once students know that you're an ally for all of the different groups that are there, they're a lot more willing to talk to you about things, to tell you their concerns, to let you know what it is they'd like to act on. Um, and so I'd say reaching out and building those personal relationships is like super important. Great, we've got some Great. We've got questions. Questions. Um, um, that's an echo going on. That's How many organizations to get kids connected to, and what topics are too big for kids to be talking about? That's my first set of questions, and I got more for you. So the first question is, how? What organizations do you get them connected to? Yes. How do you know what organizations to get them connected to, and what topics are too big for kids to be talking about? I think the second question is easy. Nothing. Nothing is too big <laughs> yeah. to be talking about. Yeah. They need to be talking about all of this stuff. I think to say that a topic is too controversial or too challenging is just, it's unfair to the kids because they're capable of handling it and it just reinforces the status quo. Like, oh, we can't talk about this or we can't talk about that. Some of their parents might be too immature to talk about it. The students are. And that actually happens a fair amount where they can't talk about certain issues at home with their parents. Yeah. Um, and so I think having a space where they can talk about things like that in the school <laughs> is like super important. What? <laughs> that, that comment. Air horn. <laughs> um, I used to be in this touring rap duo, and this was like at a time when uh, a lot of thousands, when a lot of rappers were hitting air horns on their samplers, like bam, 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 bam. <laughs> so we would do it on the microphone. We would, we didn't have any so, new shit, bam, and then the rapper I was touring with would go arf, 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 like a barking dog because they would play samples of dogs. But it was hip hop is so stupid sometimes. Say. What are we talking about? <laughs> uh, what, uh, how do we know an organization? <laughs> oh, organization. Yeah, so like I was alluding to before, or I didn't allude to, I said it. Um, I'm involved in a lot of community stuff. So I'm, I'm, I have a lot of connections to community organizations locally. Um, students come up to me and say, like, I want to get involved in something having to do with the environment or whatever. Or I can say, well, you know, there's action. I know Dawn and... Dan, Don and Don um, Dannenbringer, and I can get you in touch with them. And, you know, I like I can have done work on climate change. They're like, well, I want to get involved in race stuff. Like, I invited two of my students to come to a Black Lives Matter organizing meeting um, last winter, and they came. And um, they got involved to a very small degree, um, um, but it was cool for them to get connected with that. 
you know, uh, if they want to get involved with, uh, you know, something having to do with transportation. One of our colleagues, uh, Kevin Cease, is involved with a local group called Bike Blono that does bike advocacy and public transportation public transportation advocacy. And he's on the planning commission. Yeah, for the city. So like we, you know, because we get out and we do things, we know people. And um, if we can't get somebody in touch with the right person, I know somebody who could. So like somebody was wanted to do a sociology project last semester to help uh, like single mothers who might be in need of daycare or something like that. Well, I was like, I don't know who to contact about that, but I works at the YWCA and she might know somebody. So I call her and then she calls somebody and then bam, my students had mentors for their project. Like overnight, we figured that out. So, you know, it helps when you are active. You have to be active yourself to meet yeah. people. I didn't have any connections at the start of the year, but just when I started um, doing more stuff with the club this year, reaching out to people, every time I reached out for one event, I'd meet five more people that I could then use for events later on. And so once you start reaching your tentacles out in the community, that network like expands really quick. But I'm still a little bit hesitant with the Social Studies Club um, when we do events because I know there are that are very uneasy, and I've had some parents who have told their kids, like, you're just not allowed to participate in things. And so I'm a little bit cognizant of that and not wanting students to be told that they can't participate outright by their parents. Um, and so we've got some more moderate groups in town that do things. We've got the, the local Not In Our Town group, and we've got a couple other groups. So anytime there's an event and, like, one of those moderate groups is involved, I feel like that makes it a little bit safer for me because I can say, look at some of these groups that are involved. It doesn't matter if there's also more maybe what might be perceived as radical by people in the community groups. As long as there's that moderate anchor, I feel like I'm not going to have to run into any issues with that. But it is something that I, I definitely do think about because I is involved in any and every group. At the same time, I, if kids were told they just can't come at all, then it would kind of defeat the purpose. Um, yeah, Pat invited a... Uh I guess you would call him, compared to current day standards, a moderate Republican, former congressperson, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or no, federal, national congressperson. Well, we invited, um, so Ray LaHood, LaHood who yeah. was the Secretary of Transportation for Obama and a Republican congressman, we invited him to the school. And then when the kids were upset about the travel ban, they all went down to um, the, the current congressman, Darren LaHood's office, um, to register their dissent with the travel ban. They tried to get him to come to the school to also be able to give more information on why they opposed it, but he didn't want to come. But that type of thing not only is good for students to hear their perspective, but also gives us cover. It's like, no, yeah. look, we invited a Republican. <laughs> you know? We invited like three Republicans. <laughs> Sorry. I don't invite them into my classroom. <laughs> I think you guys have brought up a few, a few times you've mentioned things like uneasiness, whether it's from parents, whether it's from, you know, you just make, making sure you have cover. I think you're getting to the fact that doing this work in schools uh, takes a lot of finesse. It takes a lot of, you know, um, even if we believe our roles is, is to be activists, we don't want to uh, overstep our bounds. And I think it gets to that divide between being political and being partisan. And I wonder, you know, you've talked a lot about this happening in, a, in the social studies club. And I wonder how you think about the club versus what you would do in class uh, and how you'd help teachers who are feeling uneasy. Maybe they're in a more conservative climate can't wear Black Lives Matter shirts to class without it being seen as a, a partisan statement. Uh, how do you manage that kind of divide to make sure that you're not seen as proselytizing, even though you believe that your role as an educator is to talk about these issues? Right, that's a really good question. Sorry, I think our approaches are different. Yeah, yeah. I think you'd get fired within a week. <laughs> I don't think Stefan would really last. I mean, don't you agree? Yeah, I, I got lucky that I ended up with a department in a school, in a district, where I can get away with being myself. I Stefan can't, like, just keep it under the radar. I would try to keep it under the radar for three or four or five years until <laughs> I had, like, built up a positive reputation. As being like, oh, like, once you've built up that reputation, I would assume, and I, I'm just saying what I'm speculating, because I've taught in this school district my entire life. Um, but I would think once you've built up that reputation and you have relationships with parents, even if they don't agree with it, they'll be more likely to give you the benefit of the doubt in that situation and at least hear what you have to say. So I would say that it to maybe keep a low profile for a little bit. And, and I think my advice would be uh, just be open and be honest. I'm, I'm just extremely honest and open, and I tell my students – 
uh, that I am proselytizing and that I do have a extreme bias and I do I am here with an agenda and it's not a secret agenda my you know um, and you and I tell them so you should be suspicious of everything I'm giving you to read everything I'm assigning every project you're getting every lecture I give every film we watch is coming through my filter with my agenda behind the scenes um, so be suspicious of me and that's generally worked out so far. I've had some complaints, of course, but generally speaking, even the conservative students that I have, um, to a certain extent, respect the fact that I'm so open about everything. Because I don't think um, it's possible to be objective. I think objectivity is a myth. I think you know being bipartisan or whatever, however you want to phrase that, is a myth. Um, and I, I like the way Naomi Klein uses the phrase the fetish of centrism in our society. I don't know if I mentioned that, if we, that came up last week, but I think we need to get over this idea that we need to be bipartisan, we need to be reasonable, we need to be objective. I think that's all bullshit. It's not true. And we live in a very dangerous time right now with climate change, with racism, with all, everything that's stacked up against us right now, that we have to take a position. Um, and, and just be honest about it. Just be, don't try to dupe anybody. Just be honest about it. Do, and then, do something else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of, with two kids, I'm trying not to get fired. Um, but I would say something too, when you get criticisms or parent complaints about stuff, it can be really easy to just completely brush it off or get angry. But I've tried to kind of use it as like, okay, I'm going to take this suggestion and figure out how I can better camouflage myself and hide myself so that I don't have to worry about things in the future. So like after the election, when a whole bunch of students were just feeling lot of adults telling me, oh, this isn't a big deal. What are you worked up about? I started getting a lot more political on my Twitter account that I use for personal use and for school. Um, and I started getting very political because I wanted them to hear like positive reaffirming messages for how they felt. And so that came back and bit me in the butt a little bit when the kids were organizing that trip to La Hood's office and a parent um, emailed the principal like, look at these tweets. He's too political. And so, like, I was definitely angry at the time. I'm like, what the hell? Like, come on, there's nothing. So, but I'm like, okay. At least they contacted the principal, and now I can this so that I don't have to worry about in the future. And I made Mr. Lawler account that I use only for school stuff. And then I have my personal one that I'm still really political, and all those kids still follow me on it anyway. I thought about being really, like, passive aggressive and labeling it, like, rogue Lawler, just to, <laughs> just to like, piss them off. But now, like, like, there's absolutely nothing anyone can be complaining to me about that. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to cover my base so that this can't be a problem in the future. And so I try to look at every one of those hiccups as being a way to better insulate myself from what could potentially be damaged from anything that we do. So. Yeah, like, I don't use my social media in my class the way some colleagues do. I have an Instagram account. Um, but I have lots of students who follow my Instagram account. <laughs> I never advertise it, I never say anything about it, but I, I'm always posting like low key socialist propaganda on my Instagram account. You know, if they wanna follow it, somebody complains about it, I'm like, that's my personal Instagram account. I didn't tell anybody to follow that. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Lawler. Any also, tips for folks? One thing that um, a lot of us have heard about, and we, we also do some like youth research work where young people are getting involved in issues that are going on either nationally or locally. Uh, and a lot of times people get worried, how, how are students going to feel if they try to get involved in activism and they don't feel like they have been able to, uh, you know, get an accomplishment, get a win. Uh, and some folks worry if kids are going to get discouraged, if they get angry. Uh, how do you manage the expectations of being part of a movement, being part of activism when you may not always see the results of your labor right away and when kids are learning that lesson? So I think I can, I can kind of speak to that a little bit. Um, when we went to um, La Hood's office and when we, I brought some kids down to lobby for a state budget uh, about a month ago as well, we kind of had a conversation ahead of time with those students. Like, you know, we're going, like when we went to La Hood's office, you know, like he's in a very red district. I mean, I know you want him to switch his position instantly, but that's probably not going to happen. And so we had a discussion about like, what are we hoping to happen as a result of this action? Um, and like the students realized like one of the goals they set was if we could just encourage other people in the community to step up and take a stand to see what we're doing. And if we can just let other people, you know, uh, 
people in town that are from the Middle East or that are Muslim to know that like, hey, there's a group of high school students in this town that have your back. Like they deem that as one of the goals as well. And so we kind of talked a little bit too about um, Bobby Kennedy's quote about how, uh, what is it, the, the ripple of hope that, you know, like thousands of ripples come together when people take actions like that and make an enormous wave that'll knock down like the mightiest walls of oppression. Like you are one of those ripples. And that kind of became one of our like mantras through the year. Like we might not see the exact objective, the, the long-term objective we want met, but we're making those ripples and it's building towards something. And what was neat after the, um, they went to the Hood's office, they also did an interview on the radio. Um, and when the kids were driving back home after the interview, someone called into the radio station and it was like, they started talking about how, man, I'm, it, was, it was a man probably in like his 40s, it sounded like, and he was saying, man, these kids are like doing great things and they're having a positive effect. And, and he was like, you know, I'm a, I'm a Muslim man in this community and I'm so happy about what they're doing. And like, that got to them. Like you could hear they recorded it in their phone as it was on the radio and you could hear some of the students in the car like crying at that, like that they hadn't met some of their objectives. So I think just being realistic with the kids up front about what could be achieved and what maybe is unlikely to be achieved is important because I think if kids go in with those unrealistic expectations, then they might feel defeated and less emboldened to like do something like that again. Yeah, and I think it's another example of a time when it's best for somebody in our position to be honest and open about our own experiences. I've been doing this for a long time and I get discouraged a lot. I want to hide in my basement a lot. You know, I've, I think about quitting teaching every year. <laughs> I don't, I sometimes I'm astonished that I'm still there. Um, you know, I suffer with depression occasionally. I don't know anybody who's involved with activism and social justice work that doesn't suffer with depression occasionally um, because this is depressing work. And we feel if you just take a short sighted view, you will get discouraged very easily. So, you know, I, you know, um, my sociology class is not the most uplifting thing in the world. And sometimes students come talk to me and they're like, man, I, this class, I'm really getting down about this. And I just sit down and talk with them about it, you know. Um, what's getting down. I often often loan the book uh, by Howard Zinn, A Power Governments Cannot Suppress. That's a super good book if, one, if you want to be optimistic again, because it's just a, sh it's a bunch of short essays about um, really positive effects of social movements in U.S. history. And it, it really offers sort of a, a, a view of the, of the social movements that remind us that, you know, these things take a long time. Well, when relatively powerless people work together, they can make positive changes that they might not see at the time, you know, like the Bobby Kennedy quote. Yeah. Okay, guys, your work is really inspiring, I know, to me. I've worked with Stefan quite a bit off and on over the years, and I think it should be inspiring to all the teachers out there. Um, we're about out of time, but do you have one to two tips that you could offer for teachers who are just wanting to get started or brand new teachers in the field? Um, I can maybe go first. I would say, first off, like make sure you build up those personal relationships with your students, get to know them, get to know what issues are important to them, um, what issues are affecting them in the school. Like you can start doing that right away. Um, the other thing is when you have students that take an interest in um, a certain political issue or in your class, try to encourage them to form a club or to form a group um, that then you can start using to create events from and um, get them involved with stuff. Because I found we've had so many clubs that have formed. Remember at one point we had like a psychology club, a geography club, a sociology club, a, a bike to club, school club, a bike to school club, a yeah. kite club. Just start making <laughs> as many damn clubs as you can. And I know it sounds crazy, but I mean, you build up that sense of community, you get them involved, then you start consolidating clubs and good things will happen. But you have to be willing to start the ball rolling and you just have to do something, do anything. Yeah, and I think an important tip for teachers is they need to they need to get involved themselves. Like if they're just looking, like how can I get active? You yourself going to meetings, you know? Um, when you know Thursday night there's a whatever meeting at the you know the library, and you know you bet go to it. You know, I have a three year old. I bring him to meetings a lot because you know I I have to. So it's like. Um, as a teacher will have more insight and be able to more honestly work with students if you yourself are involved in these things. Like Pat went to Springfield 
Bobby, you know, to do things. Like he's not just going to his class and saying like, well, in theory, you could do this. He actually has been there. He knows, he knows how, how, how on the door, you know? And so, before this year I didn't. And I feel like that is experience now that will really help me going forward mm -hmm. when we want to do stuff like this in the future, people have questions. Yeah, lobbying sucks. Oh God, I talked talk to so many <laughs> Illinois. I just felt dirty when I got home. I just had to take a shower. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh, it's in Bruce Rodder's office. You know, one thing I like to talk about with my students is just calling. Uh, a week ago, I was can I was calling uh, community members about our our uh, local Black Lives Matter, NAACP, and a bunch of other groups are trying to get a civilian review board for the police passed in um, Bloomington, and I've been working on that with some people. And just a week ago, I was calling. I called probably like thirty five different people um, to try to get them to show up at this city council meeting, and uh, I got probably 33 voicemails <laughs> it's like the most discouraging thing in the world i'm just like banging my head on the desk like somebody answer the phone but this is the type of thing that i can talk to my students about they're like mr robinson i'm discouraged blah, blah, blah. like you know what i did last night i spent three hours calling a bunch of people and getting yelled at by local racists when i was trying to just get them to go to a city council and they're like oh so like you actually do you're like yeah i'm actually doing this too so like a lot more clout with the kids too when you ask them to do stuff and they're like well shit like he spent all that time doing that the least i could do is try to get involved or you know do something that if the group asked you to do your part so i think yeah setting that example and then one more piece of advice would be uh prepare yourself for some blowback like you know what however you do i meditate a lot so it's like i try to detach myself from the blowback you know, with my breathing, focus on your breath. <laughs> but whatever you can do, I don't know, maybe you exercise or maybe you- I guess, I go for a run, I don't know. But you have to be prepared for a little yeah. bit of blowback and expect it and then just be stoked when you don't get it. Yeah. That, that went really well, nobody complained. <laughs> Great, well we are out of time, but thanks again for joining us for a half hour of your summer evenings. Um, as uh, Nicole has said in our comment section, she would love to watch a weekly show with both of you. You're very informative <laughs> and entertaining at the same time. The best kind of video to watch. So, thank you. Um, and thanks to everyone who has an opportunity to watch Stefan and Patrick. Um, stay tuned and check out our website at slam.education for updates for the next Slam Assembly. And as Stefan says, here is an advertisement for Naomi Klein's book, No Is Not Enough. Pick it up at a bookstore near you. Thanks all. <laughs>